Blog Talk Radio. Controversial 
uh, court cases, uh, I guess now it would be accurate to say uh, releases, uh, since the Scott sisters, they have been released, uh, but to kind of look at their mistreatment, to look at their case and see if it would support uh, her statement that all laws support the system of white supremacy. Uh, real pleasure to have her back on the program for a second time. Uh, I saw her. She was at the she was at the White Privilege Conference. She was one of the uh, keynote speakers uh, in Lacrosse 2010, um, and yeah, just super delighted to uh, have her back on the program. Uh, she is a law professor at uh, Dayton University, in addition to being an author uh, and an admitted victim of racism, white supremacy. Uh, please, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to hear our guest for today, uh, Professor Vernelia R. Randall. Uh, Professor Randall, are you uh, with us? Uh, Professor Randall, I think I have your line open. Are you with us? Uh, sure. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. Professor Randall, are you the person that's on the line with a hand, would that be you? Still not hearing anything. That is so crazy. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm going to shut this line down. Um, Professor Randall, if you are on the line, just make sure you press one and I'll open your line up. I only see one person with a hand up, so I'm assuming that that might be uh, Professor Randall. Uh, if you're on that line with a hand up, uh, that line is open. So, oh, okay, now I got two of them. Uh, okay, I won't try that one. I'll try a different one. 0502, we'll see if that's Professor Randall. 0502, would that be Professor Randall? This is Professor Randall. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. We uh, got disconnected. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me back, back. I'm happy to be here. I enjoyed our conversation the last time. Oh, psh. we enjoyed it thoroughly. It has been, uh, it's closing in on two years since that discussion, and I still get people who uh, message me about how much they enjoyed that program and went back in the archives and found it. So, uh, yeah, the pleasure is, I, and we remember, I Remember that statement at the end of the program, all law supports the system of racism, white supremacy. Um, I guess for the folks who uh, who maybe haven't heard that program, so we can encourage them to go back and listen, uh, could you share a little bit of uh, information about the uh, work that you do at Dayton and, you know, why you're involved with racism? Well, I, uh, my, uh, I obviously, t I teach at Dayton, and I'm getting ready to teach uh, a course that I've been teaching now for about 10 years. It's called Race and Racism in American Law. My research area is on health systems and, and the health status of African Americans and how health systems uh uh, impact the health and what the law can do uh, to make a change. And part of that has led me to the idea that law is a social determinant of health. And, and, and pretty much that you can't name a law in which, even when it seems to be for our benefit, it is act, enacted or uh, enforced in a way that uh, undermines white privilege the least. Uh, and so, it, it, you know, there's a saying, there's no free ride. For blacks in America, there's no re free ride. No law that I know of it's not, it does not support uh, the system of, of white privilege, either in the, how it is written or how it is enforced. Wow. Okay. I'm sure we will be able to get into that. I think we actually might even be able to get into the health aspects with the uh, Scott sisters case, because that was a, a key part of how uh, they were released. Uh, you might even be able to get uh, into your area of expertise, one of your areas of expertise. 
Um, I uh, I guess I will I will pitch to Justice to see if she has questions to begin, and then I'll. So I'll go to Justice. Her line uh, should be open. Justice, if you have some questions you would like to ask uh, Professor Randall, uh, please go right ahead. Hello, Professor Randall. Hello, Justice. How are you doing? I'm doing good. When did you become interested in law, and why is law your main focus? Well, um, I suppose in terms of practicing law and doing law, I became interested about 30 years ago, Um, and I was a nurse at the time and a nurse practitioner, and it, 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 it seemed to me that counseling people one at a time about how to eat right is an ineffective way of addressing the issue that there's no grocery stores in the community that people can't eat right if they don't have grocery stores in the community, that uh, counseling people not to smoke, for instance, may be fairly ineffective when you have tobacco companies spending large amount of money targeting population to convince them to smoke, and that that changing how the law works would have a bigger effect on the health of people than all the counseling of individual people that you have. Because people basically will do the right things by themselves if they can. I uh, I think that I, I, I tell my son that I believe that people make rational decisions. It's just that they're rational from their point of view. And so when people, when you put grocery stores in people's communities, they eat more fresh fruit. You don't have to tell them to do that. They do that. Uh, And so I think that we have to find ways to change how people live in order to help them be able to make better decisions that will impact their health. How is the Scott sisters case related to law and or racism white supremacy? <laughs> oh, how that's an excellent question. Excellent question. And it it uh, the racism and I guess we'll need to break it up in parts because I don't want to talk too long and in to allow you ask questions and allow others to ask questions. But if you look at how they went to jail, uh, it, that the injustice in a system that w- w- even if you believe the facts of the case, even if they were involved in a robbery, so I'm not. I, we don't need to go to the fact that they're innocent. We can say we accept that they were involved in a robbery. So then, what we're saying is, they didn't do the holdup. They didn't have a gun. They had 11, the the robbery itself done by the other teenagers only came out with $11, and yet they get double life sentences in jail for that. Um, That, I I think the race and gender is involved here, and, and I particularly believe that black women are dealt with very harshly when they get them from the criminal justice system. Um, And so I think that when you look at that part of their uh, their, uh, sentencing, we can see a clear example of how the justice system uh, treats, uh, is designed to put people in jail to maintain a prison complex. And those people are disproportionately black, and those people are disproportionately, of the women, they're disproportionately black women and disproportionately black men. Then we look at how they were, then when we look at their release, and and I'm happy for them, but I think we ought to really be stepping back and say, wait a minute, the governor didn't pardon them 
he didn't commute their system. He suspended their system since sentence, which means at any time it can be reenacted. Second thing is that that means that they're subject to the role pardon for the rest of their lives. So they'll have to go in and in and deal with that pardon system for the rest of their lives and their young women. And finally, they he released them because they were sick and costing the state money. Nothing about the injustice of the sentence that they were under. All about, well, they've gotten sick, they're costing the state too much money. We let's, let's turn them out so that that money can be shifted to someone else other than the state. And finally, the unheard of precedent of requiring this one sister to give a kidney donation to another. It, that all is smacks of racism and white privilege. Your book, Die While Black, do you think that this incident relates to your book? If so, how? Well, I think one of the things we can talk about is the the health disparities among – my book, Dying While Black, is about the health disparities among African Americans. And certainly uh, the, the the Scott sisters have uh, – have, are experiencing that health dis- disparities with the kidney uh, problems of one sister and the health issues of the other sisters. So you have two sisters that are both uh, sick, which uh, relates to the health disparities. You have uh, health disparities in health care. Um, an interesting thing for to think about is it's going to cost the state too much money, but the sisters get out. How will they pay for the health care they need? Now, one, the one that needs a kidney may be able to get federal dollars, but uh, the other sister was all, has also been sick. And so uh, now we have a health care system that doesn't uh, have quality health care for everyone. Uh, notwithstanding uh, the uh, health care reform, it's, it doesn't take effect. If it takes effect, it won't take effect for several more years. And so uh, still there are going to be uninsured individuals with pre-existing conditions and no private insurance will, will want to take them on. How does talking about <clears throat> law help to replace white supremacy with justice? Uh, you know, I, I don't think talking about it does anything. I think it just raises our consciousness. The only thing that I think replaces white supremacy and justice is action. Uh, and to tell you the truth, I tend to think that it takes group action. It takes action which uh, is unexpected and out of the ordinary. Uh, but what talking about talking about law and helps us to know where we need to take action, what we need to, uh, where the problems are, and, and perhaps to lessen the impact of the laws on our individual life. But I I really think that um, books like my own books give you information. If all I do is talk, if all I do is read a book, I haven't really done a lot to change how the law relates to our lives. Um, that takes more more action. I see. Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions at this time. Go ahead, Gus. Context of white supremacy. Um, okay. 
I guess I would like for you, because the program has grown since you were with us the last time, and we have a lot of people listening who are outside of the states. Um, I guess I would like to start with just kind of a brief overview of what happened uh, in this case. Um, I guess I could do it, but since we have the pleasure of having a law professor here, uh, I'll ask Professor Randall if you could kind of give our listeners just kind of a brief overview of what happened in this case, and then we can kind of pick apart um, if different facets uh, of what happened to the Scott sisters sisters supports uh, the notion that all laws support the system of Islam. Um, could you kind of give us a brief overview based on what you what you what information you have? Okay, I'd be happy to do that. About 16 years ago, uh, two young, uh, several teenagers were uh, 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 were involved in one way or another uh, in a robbery. Um, uh, two of them, sisters Jamie and Gladys, uh, were said to have. Uh, escorted a couple of men to some teenage boys. One of the teenage boys had a gun. None, neither one of the sisters had any weapon. And that a robbery took place. Eleven dollars were stolen. No one was hurt or injured. Okay. Now the sisters maintained that they were not involved in the robbery. And the uh, young boys initially uh, for a plea deal said that they were. The boys who actually did the robbery uh, ended up spending only a couple of years in jail. The sisters, and I think that's primarily because they pled it out, the sisters maintaining their innocence uh, and thinking that justice would prevail uh, went to trial, was found guilty, and received double life sentences. Um, in, and now they're in their early 30s. Uh, they've been sick, um, uh, one of them seriously sick, critically sick with uh, uh, needing a kidney transplant, and there has been a big movement to get them released from jail. Um, a movement led heroically by their mother um, at times when nobody was paying attention, but eventually it spread uh, and a, a pressure was eventually brought, brought on to Governor Barber and he um, gave them suspended, I don't want to say pardon, because he didn't pardon them, nor did he commute their sentence. Even though he's commuted five murderers' sentence, he didn't find it, uh, he didn't commute their sentence, he suspended their sentence, and on the condition that one sister would give a kidney to the other sister. Uh, they have been released. I understand that they're going to be going. There. They were. This was in Mississippi, the state of Mississippi, but I think they're going to be living in Florida where their mothers and their children are. One has two children and the other has three children. And so this, this case raises a lot of issues in terms of uh, uh, blacks going to jail, the, the use of plea bargaining, bargaining uh, and how it can in, in, uh, could cause people to uh, make up stories on other people in order to get a light, lighter sentence. It has issues of uh, disproportionality in sentencing. I mean, the sisters, there's still no way to understand, even if you accept that they were involved in a robbery, the question becomes why double life sentences for not being the person holding the gun, not actually doing the robbery, and no one getting injured, and eleven dollars being the maximum uh, money out of it. So it, it shows the, the the just the brokenness of the criminal justice system. Wow. Um, I 
guess before I get out, because I would really make sure I tease out the plea bargain aspect of the case, but just as author, in your opinion, um, does it seem reasonable for two individuals who do not have a prior record, no previous convictions, um, to be uh, involved in this sort of crime, an armed robbery, uh, $11 taken, no injuries, uh, no one was harmed. Does it seem reasonable for an individual involved in that sort of crime to receive a double life sentence? Oh, absolutely unreasonable. Absolute murderers go to, uh, you can be convicted of manslaughter and not go to jail for for a double life sentence. There's no rhyme or reason as to why they receive a double life sentence, except I suspect my own analysis is the jury didn't like their attitude. They they were sending probably some some kind of signal about you know how being uppity or something, but it doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't make any sense that. The governor haven't commuted this sentence before now. He, it, uh, it seems to me that it is really a, um, a injustice that they've spent 16 years in jail on this, and that this should have been something that was commuted at least after the third or fourth year. Okay. Um, and again, I want I want to make sure people keep that in mind. The the actual folks in this crime that they were convicted, uh, which they were convicted, the individuals involved who actually had the guns, uh, they were convicted and they served. I believe it was two years. Two years. Um, that's correct. Been released. <laughs> um, they they've been released long time ago. Um, the the role that plea bargaining play this case. Um, the, gen- the individuals who actually had the firearms in this crime, uh, according to reports that I've read, um, a part of their plea, they testified against or gave uh, testimony against the Scott sisters uh, and talking about their involvement. Um, how does that, these plea bargains, or to your knowledge, are plea bargains used to support the system of racism, white supremacy? Well, first of all, the, the, assist, the, the system of, race, the, of racism and white supremacy in criminal justice is one in which we have a need. We have a need for prisoners, okay, uh, and we have a need to. Uh, uh, we have a need for conviction. So, you, um, and we have a need for those people not to be overwhelmingly white, which they would be if the system was unbiased because there are more white people in this country than there are black people. So if you if the system was a straight up fair system, you would see more white people, not disproportionately black people. So but what happens when black people get in the system? We get overcharged. Uh and overcharged meaning bringing charges high the, the highest charge possible that can be defended and then we use that to to plea bargain down to something reasonable so that the prosecutor who is an elected official and his underlings can all claim success in fighting crime because look how many uh, criminals they took off the street. We do not have the money or time or resources to prosecute all these crimes. And so we use plea bargaining as a way to uh, get people to confess. One thing, so you, what you want, the, the ideally then you turn, you, you take one set of people and you plea bargain them down and have them testify against another set, uh, which makes it easier if you go to trial. This, the way this supports white supremacy is that it supports a dysfunctional system that targets blacks 
in African Americans. The plea bargain in itself is, as far as I know, um, is not an, uh, a a tool that is um, targeted primarily towards blacks, but it is a tool used in a system that targets blacks. And consequently, it's a tool that helps maintain the white supremacy as a disproportionate number of blacks go to jail and disproportionate whites who could go to jail do not. Do you you think it's standard, I guess, in terms of getting uh, someone, once they have been charged with a crime, uh, to give information, I think they, they call it snitching, to give information uh, about another person or another group of individuals uh, to try to reduce uh, the punishment that you might get uh, to help uh, enforcement officials and district attorneys to help them uh, pursue charges on another person. Do you think that has any racial aspects? Because that seems to have happened in this case. Well, I think that what you have to say is that anything that occur everything that occurs within our criminal justice system has a disproportionate racial aspect that 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 no tool that they use is it one to one so blacks get charged at higher rates than white uh blacks are are used disproportionately to to uh to snitch on others um I think that and criminal justice is not my area of expertise so i'm I'm a little bit uncomfortable talking about this i talk crim although I did teach criminal law several years um I think the way to think of it though is to say that any tool uh, is going to have a racial impact. It's going to be used disproportionately uh, against blacks and uh, and consequently have a racial impact. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, this case, uh, Jamie and Gladys, uh, Scott, um, in greater confinement for uh you know more than 15 years uh right 16 years double yes ma'am on this uh double life sentence uh that they each received um and i didn't i didn't do I, I, this is the first time that i've done a program about this and i've been on the air for almost 2 years and i knew about the case i'd heard i know tons of other people i know some folks have done you know at least 50 at least radio programs about this case and just following it and trying to do what they can to uh, assist uh, the sisters. And I said, the reason I didn't spend a lot of time on it is because this happens every day uh, to black people. There are, uh, in my estimation, thousands of Scott sisters who end up incarcerated and no one even knows their name, that this is just standard operating procedure uh, under the current system that we live in. Um, do you think that that's accurate? I think that's absolutely accurate, and I agree with you 100%. I, I'm happy for the sisters that they've been able, that they were able to rally to get this worked on. And I think that to the, but I think to a large extent, the way white supremacy is maintained is by getting us to focus on the individual instead of the system. And so here we are, all focused on the individual while the system goes completely unchanged. And furthermore, we're patting the system on the back. People are telling Governor Barber what a great thing he did. Well, not really. He didn't do that great of a thing. It's something that should have been done years ago. You you don't do you're not doing a great thing to do what you should have done years ago. Meanwhile, we're looking for the next individual to help. That is, there will be another Jamie and Gladys Scott that will grab our attention and we will work to get them. Meantime, 
we're doing very little to to affect systemic changes that will affect everyone. So I, 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 I agree with you. I think the reason is that systemic change, changing systems is hard, if not impossible, <laughs> on an individual level, on even a large group level. I think the system only changes significantly when it's so distressed uh, by either that it has no option but to make a change. So some cas- uh, catastrophe or something so significant happen. Now, one of the things, for instance, uh, uh, this is a gender change, gender change that happened during World War II. Well, during, one of the things that didn't people didn't talk about is how women got all of these opportunities during World War II, when before the war women couldn't hardly get any jobs, and after the war they took the jobs back. But during that period of the World War II, when there were not when most of the men were gone. The system had to change. It had to stop uh, discriminating against women, excluding women. I think that there, until we find a way to distress the system on a sustainable way, that it will always be able to respond to us in a way that gives us a little bit but protects themselves. So they may give us one step forward, but they will take two steps backwards. Uh, and, uh, and I see working on the individual cause as something that makes us feel good, impacts those individuals' lives, but does zero to change the system. Hmm. Context of white supremacy. Um, I did want to make sure um, the gentleman, as you have emphasized, which I appreciate, he did not pardon the Scott sisters. That would be Governor Barber. He did not pardon them. He suspended their sentence. Um <laughs> Uh, Which, in Governor, my estimation, uh, means that 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 in my estimation, that means that he can come back at any point and and reinstitute the sentence. Hmm. Hmm. Very important, I, folks. Should keep that in mind. That uh, it, just I want to make sure my understanding is accurate. This means that at any point, if they, I guess, if they make any violations, if they get in any sort of trouble. Uh, the governor can rescind the suspended uh, suspended sentence, and they can be placed back in greater confinement, back in prison immediately. Is that accurate? That's what I would think. And not only that, he made it a condition uh, that one sister gives a kidney. Well, the problem with that is ethically that's illegal in terms of in our society kidney uh, organ donations are supposed to be voluntary it can hardly be mm-hmm. voluntary if it's a condition of your of your release that you do it secondly she may she's been in prison she's sick herself she may not be a, a good donor what happens to her then is he going to w- withdraw the uh the, you know his suspended sentence if she can't donate um there are laws that govern kidney donations and who can give them and when they can give them uh and those are federal laws and so um you can't just say to people you got to give a kidney uh, but if he gets away with this we should be worried about whether this may set some kind of precedent for uh, using prisoners uh, who are disproportionately black, using them as a source of organs. Give an organ and you can get released. Mm. Double whammy. I actually read a report uh, earlier today and uh the author was addressing the point that you just raised and saying uh, 
this is setting a really ugly tone. Like we should really think hard about this. Uh, if I am up for parole, um, am I, should I go and say, you know, Hey, I'm going to donate uh, a kidney, you know, to such and such, you know, will that boost my chances uh, of getting approved for parole? And is that, is this a precedent that we want to set uh, for anyone who is incarcerated in terms of a way that they can be released? Um, and, and I haven't really heard. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, the, the, no one's really talking about that. The part of the problem is, is that you feel kind of caught. The catching is you're happy for the sisters, okay, happy that they are going to be released. And you really don't want to do or say anything that undermines that. On the same token, though, you have to look at you know, what does it mean to say to prisoners that a condition uh, of your, you can get out of prison if you decide, if you want to give up your organs? And we know that there's a long history, and this goes back to something in my book. There's a long history of, of, um, of illegal research uh, on blacks in, in prisons. And this is we just take it to a new level. Oh. Harriet Washington, medical apartheid, that might be a good exactly. reference uh, for folks uh, listening in. Um, and Dorothy Roberts, killing the black body. That, that would be two, I think, excellent references uh, for this. Um, with, with regards to uh, the kidney, um, what do you think about the fact um, – Gladys Scott, she says that she had made this offer to donate her kidney uh, years ago, um, and, you know, they got uh, no response. Uh, it didn't help their case at all. Um, do you find anything of interest in terms of why now, uh, after 16 years now, okay, if you donate us kidney, uh, we will be released to you? Do you see any significance around that? Well, I think we know that Governor Barber is trying to back tr- – he w- he wants to run for president, and he's made some uh, unfortunate comments about uh, – in relationship to uh, the uh, – the, um, what's that? Um, uh, the Citizens Council? The Citizens Council. And uh, and 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 that has led him to look, to let him to be have to deal with race issues, and I believe that that the, his releasing them is an attempt to uh, try to uh, uh, repair his image, but <laughs> in doing so. He couldn't bring himself to talk about injustice. He couldn't bring himself to say that they have been unjust, uh, you know, that they have they should be released because of the, of the injustice in his sentence. So what was left is their illness. One, only one of them is ill. And so to release the other one, he grabbed upon the kidney donation. That's my thought. That That was... That was a way to uh, release them both. Hmm. I hope uh, <clears throat> people who have been listening to this program uh, consistently, uh, Governor Barber should not be, you know, a brand new uh, name. You should be familiar uh, with Governor Barber and the remarks that he made about uh, the Citizens Council uh, and the good work that they did in the state of Mississippi. Uh, also, Frederick Germain Carter, the uh, black male who was found uh, hanging in a tree, uh, also happened in the state of Mississippi. Governor Barber had absolutely nothing to say about that incident. Um, nothing. Um I will uh, I will go to justice, but I have some more thoughts about Governor Barber. Uh, justice, if you have some questions, please go right ahead. What specifically can groups do to replace white supremacy with justice? Well, you know, the the question becomes 
identifying the systemic issues that you that you want to work on. When we say what, if we say replacing white supremacy with justice, that just seems to me to be really large. And I think what groups can do is look at particular small systems and take action. I think we need more. I think we need more demonstrations. I think we need more uh, getting out in the streets. I think we need. I think that that we become way too polite um, in our actions, and that we need to take actions that disturb the system enough for them to be able to say we have to do something. I think we need to know what needs to be replaced. That's why I think programs like yours is really good because I think that that gives us a place to say where do we want to agitate to take action. I, for instance, I believe that we should be looking at the criminal justice system who gets uh, in plea bargaining and in the misuse of it and uh, and that we should be taking uh, strong action to limit when and how it can use be used. In the CNN video, jailed sisters say they're not bitter. Do you think the non-white person in that video was mistreating the Scott sisters? If so, how and why? Excuse me, I don't under I don't understand. Uh, the Scott sisters say in the CNN video that they're not bitter. I don't think I saw the CNN video, so I can't comment on on how the person treated them. Okay. Um. If you go to Block Talk Radio, it's uh I think a Gus uh posted the the video, so uh you can watch it. What are some ways of how to get information about law? Well, uh law is like a priesthood. We deliberately um try to make it not as accessible. Um, I would encourage everyone to start studying the law on their own. There's some programs like called Street Law. There's People University that does law stuff. Uh, I think in your area of the entrance, it, anything that what relates to your life, you should say what is the law and and try to figure that out. One, uh, it's not that easy because the, uh, we have temples called law libraries. You can't go in the average uh, store and, uh, and just get law books, and you can't go to the average library and just get law books. Uh, law books are located in law libraries. But there are uh, some uh, uh, books written for lay people, so I think that's one way to... Um, to get it, I think that uh, to get information. When non-white people read your book, Dying While Black, what questions have they asked you about your book that helps you to work against racism, white supremacy? Well, I think the main thing that uh, that people are surprised at uh, that um, that middle class blacks are sicker than middle class whites, and that middle class black get very different health care than middle class whites. And sometimes, you know, which is not to say, uh, one of the things that I have been pushing is. I've been trying to help middle class blacks see that the condition of white supremacy has an immediate effect on them because I sometimes think that uh, that we as middle class blacks 
think that it's all about poverty and not about race and so that we don't, we don't need to do anything about racial injustice because uh it's it's really about cla- uh uh a uh, class injustice that when when people ask me those kinds of questions about questioning whether or not it really middle class blacks are really experience racism that put are 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 held back by white privilege that pushes me to work even more hmm. um i don't have any more questions at this time context of white supremacy um <clears throat> actually i will wait a bit before I get back to uh, Governor Barber, um, who is presidential candidate for 2012, ladies and gentlemen. Um, with regards to health, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Jamie had the, Jamie Scott had the issues with her kidney um, at the time that she was incarcerated. I'm not sure. Um, I don't but, think she did. She developed them. I th- I'm pretty sure she developed them in prison. Okay, okay. Can you talk about that, um, the, the negative health aspects of being in greater confinement for 16 years or even, you know, 18 months? Well, I mean, we know that stress is 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 of any kind, chronic stress of any time has uh, acute effect on your physical body. I mean, that's pretty much proven uh, in research. And so being in prison for any amount of time is a chronic stress. Being in prison for 16 years uh, is a chronic stress that is, I, I would be surprised if kidney tra- kidney problems were the only problems they had on top of that, uh, prisons are not known for the quality of their health care so, or the foods they eat. Uh, and so what you have is uh, chronic stress with a lack of quality health care. Um, I guess how does that compare to uh, the slave health death, the slave health deficit, and uh, if anything, does that extend that deficit? Well, I mean, the slave health deficit now has been replaced, I mean, has been complicated by the current day racism and the chronic stress of our racism. I think that, that that's just one more aspect that is affecting black health. But I think that, and, and, and that is an add-on to the other things that black people are experiencing. I think that current-day racism impacts health. Just the average person living an average life, that's why we have so much illness in the black community. It's, it's because of the chronic stress of racism that we live under. Add prison on to that, and that just multiplies the effect of current day racism. Mm. Wow. Wow. And you, you just, I want to make sure folks caught that. You said you would be surprised if the kidney ailment is the only problem that these two sisters are suffering from. Oh, absolutely. Prisoners. The people who get out prisoners come out of prison usually are not the healthiest people. They have more health problems. Um, they uh, uh, they have more they have both more chronic disease and infections infectious disease than uh, uh, than the, than the uh, rest of the population. And prisoners are usually too sick or have too many infectious diseases to be considered good organ donors. So I, I question that whether or not uh, Gladys 
if she is a match, and nobody even knows whether she's a match or not, I question whether or not her health will be sufficiently well enough for her to be a donor without even knowing. I, without knowing her, I would suspect that she has health issues herself. Um, just for folks listening in, I don't want there to be confusion. The uh, the video that Justice referenced, uh, CNN, they've done um, a couple of reports on the Scott sisters and their release. The individual who's talking to them, uh, Justice, she said it was a white person. She asked if uh, that white person was mistreating them. That reporter is uh, Soledad O'Brien, who uh, I don't think is a white person, but I could be incorrect. I just I thought that was interesting for anyone who's looking at the video uh, in the description for this program. Um, let's see. With regards to uh, – <laughs> yeah, that's, that is interesting. Uh, back to Governor Barber, uh, 2012 presidential candidate. Um he he did not pardon the sisters, and they said they're working on that. They said uh, that they, they want to continue the legal fight to actually get that pardon uh, to clear their names because they said that, you know, they're innocent and they, they want to uh, continue the, the legal battle. Um, well, what they need is something different than a pardon. They're eligible. Uh, they need, uh, yeah, they need a pardon or they need this census commuted to time served. So that they'll be completely, completely free of the criminal justice system. Mm, I see. I see. Wow. In in the video, um, they did say that they're uh, they're not bitter about anything. Um, they said that they think race is a factor, and they think uh, poverty is a factor. Uh, when you were speaking earlier, you said, particularly them being black females, uh, the justice system is especially harsh uh, in dealing with uh, black females. Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, really, my conclusion, the only way this situation vanishes completely, if they're white, I think the outcome in this situation is totally different. I think if, I think if, if, if we it, switch if them two, in the If two white women in their circumstances, they probably wouldn't have even gone to jail. They may not have even been charged. Hmm. If it had been two white men, what do you think? I think it's possible the white men would have gone to jail, but they would have gone to jail for less time than the black men. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if they're black males, how does this situation play out? Well, I think the thing with black males, I think that uh, that black males are routinely treated harshly, very harshly by the criminal justice system. But I think one of the things that happens is that black men, as compared to black women, I think black women involved in crimes offend the sense of whites more than black males do. Hmm. I, think think that, I think that I think I'm not sure why it is. I don't know if it's and in fact, you know, there's a thing happening round now in the case of uh, domestic violence where uh, where black women who are trying to defend themselves in cases of domestic violence are arrested more frequently than white women who are trying to defend themselves in domestic violence cases. Uh, I don't know why it is. There is a definitely gender difference. I'm not, I'm not saying the situation is worse for black women. I think more black men are in the system, more black men are caught up in the system, and more black men are sent to jail. But I think that black women, for the crimes that they commit, their sentences are much more harsher than white women. And I'm I'm not sure why that is. 
have, uh, do you have other examples of where you've seen this? Uh, examples of black females receiving really unreasonable and harsh treatment in the uh, criminal justice system? Not on the top of my head. When I was teaching criminal law, I, it, it, that was an impression that I got from reading some of the cases and things. But I'm happy to do a little <laughs> research and come back sometime. That's the deal. That's the deal. Wow, uh, Professor Roberts. She, uh, I had. She's done two trips as well now, and uh, she said she's supposed to be working on a new book. She's going to come back a third time. I'm going to ask her that when uh, when she comes back, if she has, if that's been her observation as well. Um, unusually harsh treatment for black females, as compared <laughs> to white females. Okay. 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 Now, and even black males. If you take- well, the thing is, is I I, I want to compare, I not compared to black males, but black for the same crimes. I think so. I think the problem is, first of all, take out the drug stuff, because a lot of the people who are in jail are in jail for uh, small amounts of uh, drugs. Um, when you compare black females that have been involved in robbery and things like that, I think you, that as the sentences as compared to white female are very harsh. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna very. I, my interest has been piqued. I'm going to uh, when I get Professor Roberts back, I will I will ask her that. Um, okay. <clears throat> wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, back, okay, back to Mr. Uh, Governor, Governor Barber. Uh, and I wanted to read this. This is from the New York Times, just so that you have a, a gauge to compare things. Um, I looked for the racial classification of these individuals, but I could not. Uh, I read a different report where uh, the author said that these are white people. So I have seen that, but I haven't been able to confirm. So I just want to be truthful about that. But this is uh, an op-ed piece from the New York Times, and uh, it's talking about uh, Governor Barber's record of whom he has pardoned. And it says that uh, the Mississippi Department of Corrections confirmed uh, Governor Barber's role in the five cases. Uh, These are five pardons. Uh, Noting the specific orders were signed on July 16th, 2008, Uh, Governor Barber pardoned uh, Bobby Hayes Clark. Uh, He was serving a long sentence for manslaughter and aggravated assault, having shot and killed a former girlfriend and badly beaten her boyfriend. Uh, Governor Barber pardoned Michael David Graham. Uh, He was serving a life sentence uh, for murder. Uh, Graham had stalked his ex-wife, Adrian Klasky, for years before shooting her to death as she waited for a traffic light in downtown, uh, this is a city in Mississippi. Uh, Clarence Jones was pardoned by the governor. Uh, he had murdered his poor girlfriend in 1992, stabbing her 22 times. He had already had his life sentence suspended by a previous governor, uh, Governor Ronnie Musgrove. Uh, Paul Joseph Warnock was pardoned by Governor Barber. Uh, He was serving a life sentence uh, for murder of his girlfriend in 1989. Uh, Warnock shot his girlfriend in the back of the head while she was sleeping. And William James Kimball, uh, also pardoned by Governor Barber, uh, he was serving life for the murder and robbery of an elderly man in 19. 91. Uh, this is confirmed by the Department of Elections. Uh, and as I said, I have seen reports that all of these folks are white. Um, does that have any individual? Well, it got- goes. So see, it just goes to show you here we have white or not. It, what it, is it white? It just makes it worse. But if it's if they're black, then it goes to the gender thing. Here we have men. For the most part, I think four out of five of those killed women. 
and and there was there was no claim of injustice that the men were innocent and that they were unjustly imprisoned. He pardoned them just because he wanted to pardon them. And yet you get to these two black women who at best, I mean at worst I guess, at worst was involved in a robbery where nobody was hurt and $11 were taken. And he can't pardon them. That has to be a racial gender thing. There's no there's no explanation for it other than and that the that if it wasn't for him running wanting to run for president and for the problems he had, I think that that he wouldn't even be pardoning them now except for the combination of him wanting to run for president and the combination of him having had these pre- the most recent previous problems. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, and I can make sure. Uh, the same state, Mississippi, the same state, this is where the body of Frederick Germain Carter, 26-year-old black male, His body was found hanging in a tree just a couple weeks ago, and the governor has said nothing about this incident. Uh, The family has said, you know, they suspect foul play. Uh, It happened just, you know, a few miles from where the body of Emmett Till was found. The governor has said nothing about this, and uh, the state newspaper in Mississippi, uh, they have had no articles uh, about this incident, all in the same state. Um, this, just the fact that this gentleman, uh, Governor Haley Barber, um, I think is seriously being considered as a candidate for uh, unseating President Obama in 2012. What do you think that says uh, about the system of white supremacy 2011? Well, I think part of the problem we have is if we, if we, if we look at the system, I think the, I think that the problem is much greater than um, Barber uh, and his candidacy. Uh, I think the problem is that the whole system is one that uh, maintains white privilege. I think we've seen that by President Obama, that, uh, that most of his actions have been ones that support and maintain white supremacy. And so that we have a basic system that no matter who's in charge, their primary job is to protect the free market white supremacy uh, um, uh, structure that has been in place, that it may be worse under some people, like Barbara, but I don't think that we should be focusing on that because it's only marginally better on, under the Democrats and people like Obama. Uh, and until we are really ready to deal with that, that the the whole system, whoever's in uh, power, uh, supports white supremacy, then, it, you know, it, it, to me, focusing on Barber is sort of irrelevant because he's, it won't matter whether he is in power or not. It's going to be, the system maintains itself as it is with anyone who's in power. Hmm. Hmm. I agree. I agree. Um, Justice, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask uh, Professor Randall? Yes, I do. What media would you recommend for children to learn and understand racism, white supremacy? Oh, I really don't have an answer to that, uh, largely because I don't really, my work is not really, has not been really focused on children and where they can, um, where they can best. I would hope that my book is accessible to 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 uh young uh high school age uh uh children and um, but I really can't talk about 
um, the teaching tolerance meeting. I, I really can't talk to that. I really don't know to tell you the truth. Okay. Um, glad you came on the cows again. What constructive information have you shared that you hope will help non-white people replace white supremacy with justice? I think I, I hope that the thing that I get across is, is that we have to find a way not to focus on the individuals that are in that has gotten caught up into the system, like the Scott system sisters, but focus on changing the system. If you only have so much, we all are very busy in our lives. We all are trying to maintain our lives. So we all only have so much energy that we can give to uh, to working on this. Uh, but if we all gave the amount of energy we can to the right thing, then I think it's possible that we can make a difference. But I think that as long as we put our energy on helping individuals instead of changing the system, that what will happen is, is it's like plugging a leak in the dike instead of building a new dike. Yes, we can plug a lot of leaks, but there's going to always be leaks as long as the dike is, is broken. What we have to do is find a way to build a new dike completely. Uh, and while we're doing that, it is possible that some individuals will not have their things worked on. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking people if you have to choose between helping the individual and working on changing the system, work on changing the system. Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions, but I just want to say that um, thank you for coming on the cows uh, again, and I hope you can thank come you. back uh, on with us. I would love to come back. Thank you. Context of white supremacy. Um, a lot of folks called in, so I do want to go to the phone lines. But I think it's. Uh, I've just noted. It seems you're you're saying to not get too focused on the individual uh, amongst racist white supremacists or the individuals amongst the victims of racism. Uh, staying focused on uh, the system and with regards to what needs to be done to help non-white people. Uh, and how to deal with the white people who practice racism. Is that correct? Uh, that's right, because I think folk, the, 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 focusing on the uh, victims allows the system to keep, first it, it does two things. It allows the system to keep going without changing, and it when we are successful for those individuals, it allows the system to say, see, we're not that broken, it finally worked. You know, and so, you know, so Barbara and all of those, and everybody's congratulating themselves because the Scott sisters are out. But meanwhile, as you pointed out earlier in the program, there's still uh, uh, tons of people who are caught up in the system. I mean, one thing, for instance, this one systemic change that we should be working on right now with President Obama, the uh, the Supreme, the uh, the legislature changed the cocaine laws from a hundred uh, to one sentence. That is. The sentence for uh, crack cocaine was the mandatory sentence was 100 times the sentence for powder cocaine. Okay. The, le the Congress changed that to 18 to 1. Again, going back to my time, my saying that here's a chance they could have done one to one and, and gotten completely rid of white supremacy in this area, but they couldn't bring themselves to do that, so they brought it down to 18 to 1. Okay, here's the thing that needs to happen right now. Everyone who's in prison, 
under the old sentencing laws, need to have their sentence commuted to time served or the 18 to 1 standard. President Obama could do that. And there would be tons of people who would get out of jail. But it hasn't happened yet. This is this would be changing a systemic thing as opposed to working on one individual thing. Hello? Hello? Uh, hello, I got switched up. My okay. line got crossed up. I'm, I'm, I'm with you though. Um, do you? Uh, well, it's my opinion. Uh, President Obama, a non-white person, uh, he is not going to be able to make that sort of change happen precisely because it's not in the interest of white people. Do you think that's accurate? I think that if we as black people don't raise a little royal hell like the Tea Party, no, he won't be able to make a change. But I think if we would start to say, if we would start to say, look, if we would be as vocal about our issues as the Tea Party is about their issues, I think he would make that change. Hmm. I think part of I think part of our problem is is that we go quietly you know we go quietly in the night. We, somehow we have lost the spirit of this demonstration. We have lost the spirit of being angry. We have lost the spirit of getting out there and marching. We have lost the spirit of demanding something different. And, of course, we get nothing different because we don't demand anything different. I think Obama would do, would, 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 would pardon these people, uh, commute their sentences, if we as a black community was to get vocal and verbal about it and demand it. I forget which president said, I think it was, Theodore Roosevelt, but I could, uh, or Ted, uh, I, I forget which president it said, but one president said to his supporters, you want something, you have to make me do it. Because they respond to whoever is making them do it. We aren't making anybody do anything. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to think on that. I'm going to think on that one and uh, see if folks on the phone lines, if they have some questions. Uh, okay. A lot. And a lot. I, oh, I'm sorry. Wh- how much are we about 13 more minutes? Uh, yeah, we can. Is that is that acceptable? If you have 13 minutes? Yeah, that's we fine. Get okay. Groovy. That'll give us time for a few callers. Uh, the person who called in from a uh, blocks number. Uh, with a hand up. Did you have a question for uh, Professor Randall? And can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, good evening to you, Professor Randall, Gus, Justice, and to the other callers who are listening on the line. Professor Randall, I'm so glad to hear your voice on the radio, and everything that you have said so far has been very constructive information, and you're right on point. Uh, what I, have you have you heard of Alexandra Natapoff? No, I haven't. She's a professor of law at Loyola University in the Los Angeles area. And she wrote oh, a book called, yes, I've heard of it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Gus, I will pass that information on to you later. Perhaps you might like to get her on your show. Um, what she has said it has been very profound when it comes to the legal justice system. Because the legal justice system, as um, Umar Dalla Johnson says, the word law stands for legal arm of white supremacy. And we all know the laws were structured for them, and every time we, we are babies compared to these adults trying to navigate the system, and most of us, we don't know, and as you say, we don't take the time to learn the system before we find ourselves getting caught up into it. And by that time, we are at the mercy, and most of us end up having to say, please, and going to um, to prison for sentencing that is 
always handed out to us at astronomically higher rates than the average white person would be given. So I commend you for coming on and giving us this good information. We all need to read more and talk less. And I do appreciate you and Gus and Justice and everything that you have been doing. Thank you. Well, y'all are so Thank welcome. Thank you. That's great. Um, Thank you. See. The uh, person who called in uh, last, if you have a question, uh, you should press 1. For all the folks who called in, press 1 if you have a question. Uh, the person who dialed in, 6305, 6305, did you have a question for Professor Randall? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Yes, you know, I, I heard you talking about... Uh, you know, the two girls that they released, the two sisters? Yes. And it all depends on who commit the crime, because I know two fathers have raped children for years, and half of them have never went to jail, if you understand where I'm coming from. No, I understand. That's what we were saying, that that the, the, that the, it just, that it's about who commit the crime, their race, their gender, who the victim is. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to me, I don't think white supremacy is going anywhere. And, you know, I wrote a book, and I would love to just give you that book and let you read that book. It's called A Raw Portrayal of the Truth, A Poetic Way as I've Seen It and Saw It. I would love to give you that book if I could get your address because the first page in in one of my books, it say black people were brought to this country for three reasons, to serve, entertain, and keep your mouth shut. Would you agree with that? Well, I think that we were brought to serve, yes, and I think it evolved into entertain, and I think that – uh, that we don't get anything because we keep our mouth shut. Well, let me give you an example of the the two fellas that stood, uh, those uh, Carlos that stood on that platform and raised their fists, and they told white folks, they said that uh, we won your race, now what about my race? And when they opened their mouth, they blackballed them. No, I think that has been happening in the past. I, I agree with you. And in currently, too. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to imply that it is something of the past. I think if you say too much about the wrong thing, you can get blackballed today and are blackballed today. Mm. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing moment, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, several of them, in fact. Um the uh, person who called in last four digits, 5404, 5404, did you have a question for Professor Randall? Yeah, I wanted to ask her, had she ever uh, heard anybody complain about, because she was talking about uh, the health problems that people uh, get while they're incarcerated, has she ever heard of anybody complain about the, uh, the, the hazards of the food that's served in prison? because uh, there was a, a, a running joke in the North Carolina prison about the red Kool-Aid, and people used to say, don't drink the Jim Jones. And uh, the, 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 the container that it came in actually had a warning label on it. So I was just uh, wondering, had she ever heard anybody complain about the food in the prison industry? Well, not specifically, no. I know that the quality of the food can be very low, but I haven't heard any specific complaints about the food, no. Hmm. Um, let's see, Mr. Nero, uh, if you have a question, your line is open. And for the other folks, if you have a quick question uh, to ask uh, Professor Randall, press 1, and I can uh, get your line Um Mr. Nero, did you have a question for Professor Randall, Mr. Nero? Uh, greetings, Gus Justice and Professor Randall. May I be heard? Greetings. Yes, sir. Yes. 
I, I didn't have a question at this time. I just want to thank you for coming on the show. You've given us a lot to think about and consider. And I will um, re-listen to your the first broadcast that Gus did uh, with you on the show, because I think I may have missed some things. But just a pleasure having you back on the show, man. Thank you, sir. Um, not seeing uh, any other ones. I would encourage folks, uh, slave health deficit, a uh, very important concept. You can go back to the first program and get more information about that, as well as uh, a discussion of uh, Professor Randall's book, Dying While Black. Um, I did uh, want to get in. I, would, I wanted to, uh, per your recommendation, I wanted to uh, get uh, Dr. Clayton and Dr. Uh, Bird on the program uh, to yeah. talk about their work. You uh, highly recommended them. I, I worked on it and worked on it and still have not been able to get uh, information. So perhaps once the broadcast is over, if you have uh, any help with regards to getting them on the program, it would be appreciated. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm checking checking the switchboard one more time. Anybody uh, out of the folks that called in, unless you all are just listening, if you have a question, press 1. Uh, we only have about four minutes uh, left with uh, Professor Randall. Um, if you have a question, I can get you really quick. Justice, did you have uh, any final questions for Professor Randall? I do not. At the, okay. Well, I don't, I don't have any um, more uh, people. Okay. Um, the person who called in from a blocked number uh, with a hand up, uh, your line is open. Uh, greetings. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings, Professor. Um, Hello. Yes, you mentioned uh, a quote from a, uh, one of our one of the so-called founding fathers or presidents, and um, I was just thinking about a quote that I heard from uh, one of our uh, one of the so-called founding fathers. He said the purpose of schooling was to teach um, the citizens their rights and how to uh, defend their rights. And uh, he emphasized the defending part. He said because you can know your rights, but if you don't know how to defend them, then you know you that's 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 a, that's a piece that you uh, that you need to have. So my question is, do you think that uh, black people in particular, do you think that we really have any rights? Uh, I mean, uh, with this whole Constitution uh, thing where he requested that uh, she give up an organ, I mean, that's unconstitutional, so, I mean... Well, it's not unconstitutional, but it's it, it, uh, the, the laws say that it's, they should be voluntary. Now, to make it clear, it's not unconstitutional. Is it legal? Well, it, the, the, the federal law says that that you can't pay money for organs and that, and that organ donations have to be voluntary. And so there's an argument that uh, 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 requiring the donation as a condition of parole means that it's no longer voluntary. Now, her argument is that she volunteered before he... Uh, told her that she had to uh, before she before the condition of parole. Oh, okay, so she already volunteered. And what she about had her? already volunteered er- earlier. In fact, years earlier, months earlier. And so there's a whole issue of why did he wait now to uh, say that she uh, to make it a condition of parole? But even with her having volunteered. Making it a condition of parole turns it into an involuntary situation. Right. That's uh, and, and and what rights, uh, if any, do you think we have, uh, and should we be? Uh, I'm, I'm, I think we have every right there is under the Constitution. I think we live in a system of white supremacists that means that enforcement of those rights are always. Uh, done in a way to maintain white supremacy, so that 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 our our uh, 
so so I I don't think we're that we're people without any rights or people without any power. I think that we're in a system that uh, wants to marginalize our rights, wants to minimize our rights, and wants to uh, make us feel and think we're powerless as as possible, and in some times, uh, in fact, take away our power. But having said that, I think we can use the, we can learn to use the system against itself. Uh, thanks, Professor, for answering my question. You're welcome. Groovy. Um, that is going to wrap our time up uh, with Professor Randall. Um, I don't know. The gentleman uh, that said he wanted to send you a copy of his book, um, are you, I guess, comfortable giving an email address? or? Uh, well, my, uh, my contact information is all on the University of Dayton web- website. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so anyone who would like to get contact with me can just uh, 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 go to the website, University of Dayton School of Law, Dayton, Ohio, and and my contact information is there. Okay. There you go, sir, if you would like to uh, send that copy. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed the program. Um, always a pleasure to hear from you. And, uh, Thank yeah, you I would- so much. I would love uh, that third visit to get your uh, after if you can do some research on the uh, the treatment of black females. I was really intrigued by that. So uh, yeah, if you would I'll be, I'll be happy to do that. Outstanding. Uh, again, author of Dying While Black, uh, law professor at the University of Dayton, uh, Professor Vernelia R. Randall. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye context of white supremacy. Uh, I'm going to support Mr. Williams uh, at the Counter Racism Radio Network, and uh, then I'll come back. I will get the folks who uh, called in, and uh, yeah, if you have any thoughts to share around the Scott Sisters case uh, or yesterday's program, that seems people have been real chatty about that. Uh, We can get to that after the break. Uh, Context of white supremacy, we will be right back. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Context of white supremacy. Before I go to the phone lines, uh, our proud gay black man from the Saturday, January 8th broadcast, uh, he he con he wrote all this happened because of Facebook. Like he wrote comments on the uh, cows Facebook page, the one that uh, Taylor Pie constructed, and uh, I I contacted him. You know, I messaged him through Facebook to set the program up and everything, and uh, he deleted his Facebook account and he left some uh, really ugly comments during the broadcast yesterday. I didn't uh I didn't see these until the broadcast ended or I would have uh read some of his comments during the broadcast, but I'll read them now. But I just found it really interesting. He deleted his Facebook account that he had been using uh following yesterday's broadcast. And uh yeah, if it had not been for 
the diligence and hard work of Tater Pie, I would have lost pertinent information, um, name calling. I mean, it's it's incredible. And you all should go to my Facebook page and look at my post. I mean, Gus T. Renegade, Grand Slam home run uh, in what I thought was going to happen with the program. You should just look at the description that I wrote on my Facebook page for yesterday's program prior to the broadcast, prior to the broadcast. Um, yeah. At any rate, uh, Justice, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to share about today's program? I don't think uh, I have any at this time, but I just wanted to say that um, thank you uh, to the listeners for investing in my counter-racist efforts. I really appreciate it, and um, it and it makes me want to um, work harder. Ooh. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, hmm. 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 Trying to make a decision about, uh, hmm. I think I'm going to do it. Yeah. Uh, I had said before we were going to do uh, pop quizzes uh, on the program to just kind of gauge understanding um, of people. And I said the bar should be 10, 10 programs. If you've heard 10 programs, then, uh, you know, you should you should have you should be a little less confused uh, about racism, white supremacy. And uh, that should be evidenced in the way that you speak about racism. So we're going to do uh, our uh, first pop quiz. Maybe we'll do two of them today. Um, let's see, since I know I have people on the line who have heard at least 10 shows. Uh, we should have folks who are able to navigate the uh, the pop quiz. So uh, let's see. 909, are you on the line, sir? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Greetings. How are you doing? Um, greetings. Uh, <laughs> a little nervous about this pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard a lot more than ten. You should be you should be great. Like uh if you can't pass the pop quiz, then I mean we might yeah. as well stop all this now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hmm. Like I'm even having to think like I would have to I think make it pretty challenging, um, you know, for, for you to uh to botch this. Like uh, well we'll see, we'll see. Let's see. Um if uh if someone just on the spot asked you to explain uh to explain why it's incorrect or if they just asked you to explain your thoughts on uh sexual intercourse uh if they even said interracial relationships because that's the words they'll use if they said uh 909 what are your thoughts on interracial relationships you would say uh i would say i, I would first the word interracial I would ask, you know, what it, what that what that mean? What does that mean? And then, depending on what they said, uh, I would just say it's, I think it's incorrect because it's confusing. Uh, white people came up with a movie called Sleeping with the Enemy, and you know, I don't really remember what the movie was about, but that title really struck me. I mean, how can you? And then I, I remember a movie. I think it was called Burning in Mississippi where you have, you know, I think it was something to do with a white woman and she was, her husband was a, you know, a race, a Ku Klux Klan and, he, you know, he was killing people or whatever. So it's, it's it's just like, yeah, you're sleeping with the enemy. It's confusing. So how are you going to, uh, you know, especially if you say that you believe that such a system as racist white supremacy exists and, you know, I mean, how can you any more junior or not, I don't know if it's Eddie Moore Jr., but, uh, you know, white privilege con, uh, conference. And just like the professor was using white privilege today, I don't I don't really agree with that term. I think if you want to use the term privilege, it should be overprivilege, white overprivilege. That's, that's you know, a close, more accurate than white privilege. So, yeah, I would say that it's uh, very confusing and uh, it's, it's basically sleeping with the enemy. So, and then you have offspring. I can imagine. What do you do? What do you? That uh, I don't see how people navigate that. I mean, what do you do? You you have a you have offspring with your with with some, man. I mean, then you, now you now you're raising them, uh, and it's like 
Yes, it's 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 a no no man. It's deadly. That thing there is I would just say that that's extremely deadly because confusion is lethal. So, you know, you're playing Russian roulette basically with your life. And I would try to I would try to make that as clear as possible. Hmm. Hmm. And if they said, uh, you know, you're talking crazy, um, that that doesn't make any sense. You know, these are, it's great. It doesn't matter who you fall in love with and two people can care about each other and it doesn't have anything to do with racism. You know, it's just people, uh, you know, caring about each other and being in love. Color doesn't know love. What if they said that? Well, I have many examples. I mean, I have white people in my family, and I would say that caring is sharing. Caring is is is, is honesty. Caring is being telling the truth. That's caring. It's not placating people. It's not it's not dumbing down people. It's not um, you know appealing to their uh, you know their weak self or whatever. That's not caring. You know what I'm saying? Caring is truth. And so I would just give many examples of just those kinds of uh, tragic arrangements where there is no truth, there is no conversation about what what white people are doing, and uh, so that's not caring. That's not love. That ain't love. That ain't caring. If you can't be honest of what what's going on, and if you try to bring it up, it's 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 like oh. oh you know, basically shut up. I, you know, I don't want to hear you making me feel uncomfortable. Uh, you know, my parents don't want you coming around talking about no racism. So anybody that has you have to, anytime you have to put some the truth on 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 the back burner, or uh, then that ain't love. There ain't no loving relationships between white people and, and uh, black people. Mm-hmm. All lies. All lies. I wouldn't define that as love at all. So, and I think people would admit that just on an average, uh, when you have relationships, there's a lot of deception. And I think if you want to get to the deepest hell of deception, it's the relationship between a white person and a non-white person. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. What do you think, uh, Justice? Uh, what do you think of his uh, response? Um. I don't know. Justice, do you think that you can love somebody and lie to them all the time? You said fly to them? No, lie to them. Lie. Oh, um, no. Do you think that a, a black person and a white person can have a some type of relationship without uh, there being lies? No. I agree. I'm curious if we have anybody on the line who thinks that or is in a relationship with a white person that they think is totally truthful. No deception going on here. Uh, Susie is totally honest with me. Fred is totally honest with me. No lies here. I'm just curious. Is anybody on the line right now? Uh, can they take that position? Anybody? You can. If you do not have a hand, if you have not called in, please call in. Any anybody out there that uh, thinks that they're in that situation where you know they are non-white person, they are in a relationship with a white person, and they think that white person is one thousand percent correct with them at all times. I would love to hear from that person. Um, hmm. That's interesting. I, I'm curious to hear what uh, folks out there what they what they thought of the response. Our first pop quiz uh, at the uh, at the context of white supremacy. Uh, 
Mr. Nero, um, what did you think? Your line is open. What did you think of uh, the response? 909, you need to take that beret off at night when you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought, his, I thought his response was fine. <laughs> probably, probably sleeping with boots on. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh let's see. Uh I don't really know. Oh, uh caller from Georgia, female. Uh your line is open. Uh what did you what did you think of the response? I think it's response. I have to agree with Mr. Nier. I think his point his response was very accurate. What I would say is, like Pam said of the Trojan Court, any non-white black person involved in a relationship, a sexual relationship with a white person, is the equivalent of being a child molester. Because the white person is the adult in the relationship and you are a child because you have no concept of what you're getting into because they are showing you one aspect of themselves and that is part that you saw to get attracted to them, but you are not going to see the whole picture. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. Hmm. Okay. I'm just curious. This will be uh this will be fun. This will be uh this will be fun. Uh this will be fun. Okay, I have something I would like to try. This will be in the pop quiz just to see just to see what happens. Uh the person that called in uh, last four digits 6520 6520, did you have a question? Comment. Hey, hey guys, this is Jamal. Mr. Oh, greetings, Mr. Hill. Yeah. Um I wanted to ask you a question. Um yesterday I listened to your uh broadcast with the proud gay guy. What Mr. What Hill? You- do you have a television? It sounds like there's some background noise. Do you have a television on or a radio or something? Yeah, so uh, let me turn it down. Yeah. The question I'm about to get off, I just wanted to ask the question. What uh, made you have him on the program? Um, I felt like it would be to my advantage. Like uh, if uh, this is someone who alleges to be a quote-unquote proud gay black male um, that I will be able to use words to get him to reveal truth uh, about uh, what this, you know, homosexuality thing is all about and why it is not constructive, uh, why black people should be totally uh, opposed to so-called homosexual behavior. Uh, And I felt that having him on the program uh, would benefit my efforts to getting more black people to understand what's incorrect about that behavior. And I think, I hope people who listen to that program, that's the conclusion that they will come to, that I don't want any part of so-called homosexual behavior. Uh, this is not for black people. This is not for me. This is not for non-white people. This is total, uh, this is the behavior of uh, a lunatic, someone who is suffering from extreme mental illness. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Mhm. Mhm. Did you uh did you have thoughts on the program? Well, I just felt that, you know, um like people stated before, he was this very angry at black people. Now, uh in my opinion, I think uh his his anger was displaced. It should have been on white people instead of black people. And um, he just, you know, it just kept, it was like, okay, I have all this money. Look at me. I'm successful. I'm rich. You know, if you're so rich, like you made the point, once you invest in the cows. So, I mean, if, if that's the case, once you donate $100,000 to you, if money's no object, if you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. Five hundred. <laughs> I mean that's that's my point, you know. So I think that as uh, Millie Fuller Junior says, this this show off is basically 
He just came on the program to show off that, you know, I'm making this type of money. And you, when you come with facts, you um, dismissed all, dismissed everything he was saying. And plus he was doing a lot of name-calling of other gay people. Like the uh, the gentleman who wrote the book, gay, uh, the hip-hop book about men being gay. And, and Terrence he, Dean. Terrence Dean. Only a person that gets mad like that knows that there's truth in what he was writing. I mean, he don't even know the guy personally, so. Mm -hmm. So. He he had a lot of comments, or he wrote a lot of comments. (laughs) I'm so glad Tater, uh, (laughs) Tater Pie, on her job, um, on her job, she was uh, largely responsible for that program. Uh, I hadn't seen the comments that he left on the page before the program yesterday, and uh, I saw them, the ones that he left during the program, and I thought, oh, I should take a screenshot of this because he might go back and delete them. And lo and behold, he deleted his whole account uh, on Facebook, the one that he had been uh, contacting me with. And uh, I didn't take the screenshot, but thanks to Tater Pie, I still got the information. This is what he wrote. I want to read this just so you get more info about our guest. The Facebook name he was using was Brage Sandin. Brage is spelled B-H-R-A-I-G-E. Sandin, S-A-N-D-O-N. He wrote, and this is during uh, the program he, he was writing this. So he said, uh, he was commenting to someone else. I'm not going to read their comments because I just want to focus on this guy. So he wrote, uh, I don't have a lifestyle. I have a life that I live. So only white people are gay? Question mark. Honey, please. Question. Do you have a career and how much money do you make? Question mark. I'm assuming you only have a job and a lot of time on your hands like 90% of niggers. Yes, I said niggers. Poverty breeds ignorance, and seeing as most blacks are ignorant, that makes you a nigger. The black heteros, I think he means heterosexuals, I know are too busy worrying about multiplying their millions to be caught up on, in caught up on only white people being gay. If you could only see All the rich black gay men here in Atlanta, myself included, uh, there again, and there are a lot of poor niggers here, too. Get up, honey. Uh, uh, Continues. Next comment, he says, uh, I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. I'm certainly not trying to convince black people of anything. What do black people collectively own or run? If I, question mark. If I were to try to convince anyone of anything, it would be someone who had power and the means to make things happen. I'm interested in equal rights and equal protection under U.S. law. I could truly not give a damn what poor black people think or believe. You do not pay me. Your black ignorance is giving me a nigger headache. Uh... His next comment, he says, correction, I'm the pot calling the kettle a nigger. Please tune in to the show, smooches. Uh, okay, those are all his, his comments, I believe. Yeah, but these these are things he was saying during the broadcast yesterday, the proud gay black man. Hmm. Uh, was he yeah. writing this on your Facebook page or on his Facebook page? This There are two Cows Facebook pages, okay? One of them is linked on the show page. The yeah. other um, was constructed by Tater Pie. That one, um, write that on my Facebook page uh, if you can, if you have a moment, Tater Tot. Um, please, if you could write that on my Facebook page, that would be great. Then you could just go to my Facebook page, Gus Jones, and you, it'll be the first link. Uh, if Tater Pie okay. will comply with my request, but yeah, it's on. Okay. Oh, it's not even there anymore. He deleted his account, so it's not there. But the, these were posted on the other Facebook page for the cows um, that he wrote these comments on. 
this person is a fraud, and he was just putting on an air to get on the show, I believe, to voice his opinion, because from the time he came on, Gus, he was very combative. You have to repeat yourself twice when you ask, when you give out the statement about white supremacy. At first, he said no. Then you repeated it a couple more times, and then he came back in and he says, yes, maybe. So he is, he was very, very confused. And he has a lot of hatred because for someone who claims that they don't care what the black community thinks and all of the name-calling that he was doing, especially to A. And the things that he has said in, about her and in such a negative light because she has never said any of these things that he accused her of, he has serious issues. And he was just a part that wanted to get on the show. He heard the Morehouse program, and this was someone that wanted to hear themselves on a program. Definitely, that could be true. Um, I, yeah, I'm glad you uh, shared that. I think that could be true. Uh, he could uh, he could have been lying about everything just to get on. Yeah. But uh, I just think it's very interesting. <laughs> even even if that is true, like like he was saying yesterday about the uh, Terrence Dean, uh, that he's an opportunist and he just says these things to get out, uh, which could be true. You know, I don't know Terrence Dean, but. Uh, even if that's true, like that's the means or that's, you know, what you felt would be the constructive thing to do to get attention or to get resources like that's really interesting, like to behave like a gay, excuse me, homosexual black male. Uh, wow. Very interesting. Um, Even but, I, um, excuse me, I'll say oh, wait, and then I'm, I need um, to. There are a couple of people that called in. I want to get their lines open and then please, I want you to continue your comment. Uh the person who called in from a blocked number, uh, have you, and person who called in uh, 5132, uh, have you as well. You should press 1 if you want your line open. Uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. Oh, we only have three minutes left on the live stream, so you should call in if you want to continue to listen or to talk. The number is 347 215 Uh Please continue your uh Thought, ma'am. Yes, Hello? Uh, what I was about to say is that if, he, if they're both in the gay community, um, this person as well as Terrence Dean, because Terrence Dean was on an Atlanta program here about two weeks ago um, talking about a book of his that he wrote, How to Spot If Your Man Is Gay If You're Dating a Man. He, so he was on a radio show here in Atlanta. Now, if they're both in the gay community and they're both black males, I don't see why he was tearing down Terrence Dean and saying all of these disparaging things about him, as well as calling out Tyler Perry and everyone else. This man has some serious mental health issues Mm -hmm. and hate issues about himself, and he wants to tear other black people down in order to feel satisfied with himself. Your line is open as well, 8162. And uh, Mr. Hill, uh, I think I – oh, I don't see you anymore. Oh, well. I thought you were there. I had your line open too, but I don't see you anymore. Anyway, um, oh, there he is. Okay, I got you. Mr. Hill, your your line is open as well. So everybody that – the folks that called in that have a hand up, I believe I got you. And one minute left, so you should call right now. If you want to get in before the show ends at Blog Talk, 347-215-6071. Especially, especially the Honest Beckys. Uh, the Honest Beckys? What does that mean? <laughs> Did you say that you were asking for some Honest Beckys to call? Or if they know, or if they have a relationship with one? Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Is any oh somebody else called in too? Uh, five four zero oh, four, last four digits five four zero oh, four. Uh, is anybody on the line in that boat? Uh, you you are in a relationship, or you know a white person that's totally honest with you one thousand percent of the time? Anybody? Never, 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 never. You need a cricket sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look for that. I'll look for that. I did want to say I listened to the show again last night, though, and man, I it's hard for me to believe that he hasn't been in a sexual relationship with a white person. Um, 
simply because the behavior he exhibited last night, especially toward black people and acting like a racist white supremacist in his uh, abuse of, and belittling of black people, is an exact mirror of the same behavior I've seen from black females and black males who were in relationships with white people, exactly the same. I noticed he was just as combative and defensive on every question as Sarah Sutton said he was. Mm. Um and I just, I listened to it and I thought, show offism, showing off to other victims the things that white people have allowed him to obtain, the two houses, the car.